Thanks, uh, thanks Andrea, uh, for having me here, and thank you all uh, for making the hike from the engineering building to the laws uh, building. Actually, when I saw laws, I thought that's actually the name of the building, but I didn't know it was the Department of Law. Uh, that's why um, it was like the name of a guy. Um, um, so, so you will wonder how these things link, and I hope at the end I'll convince you that it's a match made in heaven. Just so you can get a very picturesque view of my path. So I stayed 10 years in Chicago, I uh, did my PhD and then worked as a faculty. Uh, that's the Bean. If you ever been to Chicago, it's in downtown, it's called the Bean. Uh, it's a metallic structure, it's very beautiful, and everybody takes photos. Then I moved to a very small town in Italy called Luca, and that's the uh, the central piazza in Nafiteatro, and now I'm in uh, Edinburgh, uh, which I hope you can see uh, well. So this is the extended picture of the lab. This is uh, not an artifact, is neither a hyperplane, uh, but is the way the people are divided uh, geographically. So most of the work that you will see today is described by, is done by Massimo Valerio, um, and uh, the line goes through these people that, you know, split themselves in multiple countries. Uh, so Valerio is a PhD student who's also sitting here at the back uh, in um, Italy, but he's visiting in Edinburgh, but he's now spending a year in the Alan Turing Institute here in London. So he's uh, like uh, very cut by the hyperplane. So if you were think that this is a, a hyperplane defined by a support vector machine, you will think that he's within the margins, right? He's like easy to misclassify. Uh, Ilka is spending time between Italy and Yale. He works on medical applications. Uh, Tom is my new postdoc. He's a mathematician uh, doing machine learning. Andre is a plant biologist. He's doing machine learning. Uh, and uh, he's not Scottish, he's Greek. Forget the outfit, it's not carnival, it's just graduation. Uh, Agis uh, is a new PhD student uh, doing uh, machine learning and medical imaging. So our uh, research interests are combining sensing, which is remote. So you either have intelligent sensors, smart sensors, small sensors, that transmit data to an oracle for analysis, uh, and somehow they have to cooperate uh, in a nice way. So it's, we do a variety of applications that I'll describe very briefly, uh, but what we really care is that how can we have this analysis influencing what we do here and how we do it uh, the best. And it's very heavily uh, oriented on machine learning and signal processing uh, purposes. I, my training is in signal processing, so I did my PhD uh, on using DNA molecules to store digital signals, so very weird, uh, in a signal processing lab, not in a biology lab, uh, with Agilos. And uh, so that's basically my whole life has been defined on a crazy mixing of ideas and disciplines. So these are 10 random uh, images of papers. Uh, I did a crazy uh, project, largely, um, for fun, uh, on uh, colorizing black and white photographs of very famous artists and paintings. Uh, this is Picasso here, and it's one of the paintings. And we had black and white photographs of their, how these photographs changed, how the paintings changed. So we had cap ar archival photos, and we wanted to always see how they looked in color. I worked a lot on, uh, I work a lot with MRI. So this is the mouse brain. I did a lot of work on phenotyping the mouse brain. So how does the mouse brain changes with respect to disease or with respect to the environment in a high throughput fashion, like lots and lots of images. Um, I work a lot on agriculture, which I'll touch upon today mostly, uh, and then large amount of work on um, uh, cardiac MRI um, and other medical applications. So. What is the phenotype? Because the first word is phenotyping. So what's the phenotype? How we look is the phenotype. We share a lot of the genetic uh, material, but small changes in our genetic material influenced by the environment affect our phenotype. So if you are in from a country that is heavily uh, 
uh, under sun exposure, your skin changes color as a response to that sun exposure. Okay? If you're in a country that doesn't have a lot of sunlight, your skin looks different. So the color of our skin is a perfect example of a phenotype. Um, the color of our eyes. So this is uh, muscles. The stripes of the muscles are a phenotype and is controlled by how the sun looks. So different muscles across the seas will have different patterns just because how the sand is. Okay? So that's a typical example of a phenotype. So it's the interaction of the genotype with the environment and random variations that controls how the phenotype uh, is. So why is it important? So think about a couple of things. So the first thing is that if the population is increasing together with climate change, if we want to eat a lot of food, if we want to have uh, agricultural products for food, to feed animals, to make clothes, we need to start producing more agricultural products, like more plants. So the problem is that the population is increasing, but the number of the land that we have is going down. We're not having enough land to start keeping, keeping growing uh, these products. So, so the choice is either deforestation, so we're destroying the Amazon, for example, for that, or we're trying to get better plants. Okay. Uh, better plants means a plant that grows faster, gives more, you know, more fiber, more fruits, more seeds, and so on, whatever. It's agriculturally uh, important. So phenotyping is a way to measure these traits, these phenomena, that we care towards a more sustainable agriculture. Okay? And um, you, a lot of the other things, if you think about understanding a biological aspect of a particular uh, organ or a species, in this case uh, is the plants, is you want to understand what we said before, the environment and the genotype, but you have to do this, solve this equation. If you think of it as an equation, then this, this, this affects that. So that you cannot more or less control because it's random. You can somehow control the genotype or estimate it because you can do sequencing. You can read the genetic material. You can read the, uh, the proteins. You can control the environment because you can have experiments in a control setting, like think of greenhouses. But that you don't have. So a lot of these technologies now exist and actually are very, very cheap. They are actually fast and cheap to read our genetic material. They are very cheap to create new genetic material and make artificial looking uh, things like new, new mutants. Uh, with the CRISPR revolution now, that's going to become even easier to do genetic editing. Gene editing, sorry. So, but the phenotype, on the other hand, is really hard. So this is a model plant, it's called Aravidopsis. It's a very small plant. Um, and these are all the different variations Actually, only 16 of those that exist naturally um, of the same plant. You can, it's a schematic, but you can really see the big differences of how their leaves looking. Okay? Total differences. Think about roses. Uh, think of any other plant uh, that you might be familiar with and look at the differences that exist. So imagine now that you have to get images of this and trying to understand how it looks. So until before, phenotyping has been done for thousands of years. The fact that we have now corn that is this big, and it has huge corn ears, okay, for those that like some corn next to the burger, is a matter of clear phenotyping by humans, selection by humans. Because we will see how it grows and we will select, we'll keep some seed and we'll hybridize them and grow them, but that's because we did it. So we're doing it for thousands of years, but if you do it manually, it's a huge uh, bottleneck. So you have to measure a lot of different traits. So when does the flower come out? When does the seed come out? What's the seed shape? What's the leaf shape? If you imagine of it doing these things manually. And at some point, there was a turning point that start people start using, using cameras uh, and images. So I'll use this problem as a motivation to kind of think how computer vision and sensing become interesting for a solution. So the world of high throughput phenotyping is the idea of using a lot of imaging equipment, uh, cameras, robots, and so on, to collect the imaging data. So there are companies that actually do this. This is an image from a company, it's called Lemnatech. You can buy a system that costs about 200,000 pounds up to 3 million. Uh, where it's this automated greenhouse with robots that go in and take the plants, put them in a chamber, measure them, weigh them, water them, treat them, put them out. It's like completely automated. 
uh, and it happens across the world or you have laboratory setups uh, this one is customized other ones with uh, small robots otherwise with other robots this is an Aravidopsis plant and so on this is a system from BUS for the big uh, uh, chemical conglomerate um, and so on but all of these solutions uh, tend to have uh, some issues this is a slide courtesy of a colleague from Germany Germany has one of the biggest uh, centers in the world so that's a robot outside in the field that's actually a robot that interacts with the plants so it looks at them measures them treats them and changes how water should I put it should I put some fertilizer should I give it more light and so on to make them grow optimally okay so different setting this is a system that stretches the leaves and uses optical flow to see where the leaves are growing uh, so huge robots here that take plants through other look at roots this is a huge system that has these plants and they're looking at roots so there are these glass plates that go through a robot and they go through every day they go into this chamber they get imaged they come out and they do the cycle maybe 10 times a day 20 times a day not, not, the amount of data produced is uh, uh, tremendous but the current limitation is that what you saw in the previous slide can only be done in a few labs that have the amount of money they have the equipment they have the size and it's really hard usually to get a customized solution that was developed for a lab and replicated to another site so yesterday I was uh, another meeting and one of the colleagues that had developed the system said the guy wants to reproduce it in Canada so the the postdoc from the Canadian lab is going to his lab for two years in order to get all the nitty-gritty details not just to uh, the hardware is not a problem but to learn the nitty-gritty details of how to put the hardware together and set it up to how to build this robot and set it up and the cameras and the software that controls the cameras and the robot so two years um, so if we keep all this know-how uh, in a certain area then that's not we're not solving the the kind of like agricultural challenge that we're facing. So a few years back, uh, I got a project from the European Union uh, together with the United States, just before I left uh, America, uh, to do something a little bit different. So how can we do it affordably and low cost? So we said, can we build a smart sensor that can send data to analyze it, uh, and then this smart sensor uh, get some feedback from the Oracle to send again more data compressed and so on and try to do this in a cheap fashion uh, that is robust uh, and affordable it can be used in a variety of labs um, the sensor actually we have now is less than 200 euro uh, use all this distributed sensing and we wanted to do it easy transparent to the user uh, and expandable so our idea was to say instead of having infrastructure in very few places then we will have more labs have infrastructure uh, and even more labs even in uh, countries with even more impoverished economies which where they really needed the most in fact now we have a new project with Ethiopia uh, to actually do some things that I show you today in Ethiopia okay so three steps Ah, this is our website that basically has all the information on the product uh, and the software and the hardware and everything uh, so you can see we have uh, three easy steps set up the sensor just Raspberry Pi based uh, download uh, uh, connect it to the internet set up, uh, analyze the data on a workstation or on the cloud uh, based on the uh, uh, scientific infrastructure okay and it solves several computer vision uh, problems the secret of these are robust algorithms because we use machine learning we can be robust to changing environment so if there is a big problem if somehow now I develop this thing in my lab and then it is get used to it from a plant scientists somewhere else in the world the conditions are never the same they're gonna use a different color of soil different pots different lights everything looks different so it's very hard if I use classical ways of let's say traditional image processing to be able to adapt to this changing environment and I'll show you some of the challenges later so we solve plant growth uh, it's a foreground segmentation problem, leaf counting uh, is a regression problem, and semi-automated leaf segmentation, which is a multi-instance uh, segmentation problem. So sensing, our sensor, as I told you before, is based on the Raspberry Pi platform. 
It uh, uses a Raspberry Pi camera, but you can also attach any other camera. It runs Linux, as you can expect. It's very easy to install. We're now talking with Farnell uh, and Element 14, the main distributors of uh, Raspberry Pi, to actually have a package solution ready-made for all our plant, uh, all the plant biologists that are interested. So this way they don't even have to like, decide which parts to put, put together. It just comes to them uh, uh, ready. Um, and uh, it runs also a version, uh, we have our own software that controls the uh, sensor headless, so you don't need a, ca uh, you don't need a keyboard, you don't need uh, a screen, you just log into a website and from a website you can control it. Okay, so the reason is that it's going to be, we call it set it and forget it sensing. So you just stick it up in the room that you want to monitor the plants, in the growth chamber, the growth house, and you're supposed to set it and forget it. Don't touch it. Do not, you don't need to touch it to get the data out. You don't need to touch it to get it to start. The idea, you do not want people not very familiar with equipment to touch it. Okay? That introduces errors. And errors in imaging can be problematic. So it collects data at uh, intervals. It's a intervalometer essentially, compresses them, which I'm going to talk to you a lot about today, and then uploads them uh, to the cloud uh, or via FTP, uh, or you can download uh, the data uh, yeah, as you wish. Um, so um, these are some of the example data it collects. So these are images of a plant growing. Uh, over 20 days. As you can see, these are 24 plants. Not all of them are the same. There are some Newtons, so you can see this thing. It grows really, do you see how small it is? Okay. It's not planted on a different day. It's the same day. They were planted the same day, but it's a dwarf Newton. It's a dwarf. Okay, so it's not growing uh, big. Okay. So these are from our lab. So that's why Andrea said before we start playing with plants, because we, gr we grew them in our lab. Uh, in order to have test data. Uh, these are examples from other uh, plant biologists all over the world that are using our system. Uh, so you can see how uh, these uh, plants are dancing. Okay, This is called circumniation. So they do the, the circles, the leaves, and they can do it over the day, over a cycle. So they actually move around um, when they're in a very juvenile state because they're looking for better conditions to adapt. And here actually you see uh, very small versions of the plant, very juvenile, and their root and their first stem trying to come out from soil. Okay. So the next uh, version of Fenotiki, of the sensing side, is based on a new BBSRC project uh, between uh, the University of Edinburgh and the University of West England in Bristol to try to do a 3D version of it. Okay, just so you can understand a little bit what the environment role, how the environmental, uh, how the environment, uh, how it plays a big role. This is a radish. Are you all familiar with radish? Right? This is a radish. This is the same radish, or well, the same family of radishes, grown on the same more or less setup. The difference is that this radish has been grown where all the radishes are very, very close to each other. Okay, they are competing for light. So instead of investing on the radish, this radish is actually investing in growing taller in order to get more light from my neighbor. Like, I'm trying to get more light. Can you see a radish below? There is none. So how you plant the plants and the distances between them makes a huge difference whether you're going to have a product at the end. Okay, something very very simple. So before we said that I need to compress the data because sometimes some of the sensors are in locations where they don't have internet bandwidth or sometimes they're sending too many data. There are, uh, uh, there are um, users of our system that may image this thing every two minutes, every five minutes. Um, so, and they may have 25 of these in, this, in one lab. So you can imagine what's happening. Uh, on their bandwidth uh, on that side. And sometimes these things are not in a nice uh, Edurome Wi-Fi equipped university. They are in a university, but the greenhouse is far away. 
So bandwidth locations, bandwidth conditions uh, and restrictions are always present. So which compression should I use? So if I want to use compression, which one should I do? Lossy, lossless? Uh, and which standards should I install in the system? So what would you do as a good engineer? You set up a test experiment and find out which compression has a good quality. How do you define quality? You can either have quality with respect to what the user sees, you can have quality with respect to, let's say, PSNR, or if you have an algorithm that's supposed to extract the computer vision, you just say, how does this computer vision get affected if there is compression, correct? So, in fact, things are not rosy because this is a growing root of um, tobacco and you're just trying to see the root is actually the intelligence of the plant. It's trying to find out where the nutrients are. So it travels very, very fast through soil. So you want to study how is it growing? Where is it growing? Is it growing here in the tip or is it growing somewhere here and it's taking it changes or not? If I use just a little bit of compression on the data, the algorithm that I use to do optical flow to make these measurements can make up to 380% of error. So if I were to use the system, and boot a compression of JPEG quality, let's say 85 or 75, which visually is imperceptible to us, but to the algorithm it makes a huge mistake. Okay? If uh, I do something very, very simple, I have the plants here, and I have a segmentation algorithm that separates what is green versus background. So I have a plant segmentation algorithm. Where is the plant? So this is called, and I measure the amount of green pixels. What is plant? It's called the projected leaf area as a trait. It's called the PLA. I do this with uncompressed data, and I do this with slightly compressed data. And then I look at the error. And I study this error as a function of time, as the plants are growing, as a function of individual plants. That error is not random. It's a colored error. So random errors in statistics are very easy to deal with. Do you know the solution? What's the solution if I have a population and I know the standard error, and the standard deviation of the error is this much, and it's random noise? What do I do to decrease it? to increase statistical power. If you know statistics, the way you do it is basically you increase the sample of the population. So you plant more plants. You cannot do this thing here because a random, when you have an error that is not random, you cannot just plant more plants. You have to fix the error. And in this case, the fixing the error is basically coming up with a better compression algorithm. So we already knew how to solve this because in uh, Early on, I had uh, a PhD student, uh, Eren Soyak, who basically, from a project from the Department of Transportation, so is the, I don't know if it's the Department of Motor Vehicles here, but it's basically the, the ministry that is in charge of roads uh, and uh, highways. They wanted to build very affordable, easy to install cameras on highways that can monitor traffic. And these cameras will actually look at the road um, they, will surveil they will do surveillance on the road and they will go all to a centralized location where algorithms are running to measure vehicle velocity, density, uh, and, and so on. They were not seen by humans. They were like analytics algorithms running. The classical setup is that you set the camera, then you have a box with a battery, then you have a box with a huge uh, multi the multiplexer and a T1 line running connected, so you couldn't put the camera anywhere you wanted. So we had a project and we built a, a very small setup running at that point on a 2G uh, phone. Okay? So you can understand the bandwidth considerations there. So we said, okay, we cannot send video for to be seen by human, so we should actually send video to be seen by the tracking algorithm, because we were using a tracking algorithm. So what features, how, does, how should the image look such that the tracking algorithm does not make many mistakes? So we call this thing then uh, application-aware uh, compression. And we did the same thing uh, for plants, uh, more or less, where we say we know what type of analysis we're going to do here, so we should focus bits on objects of interest and data of interest. So, and we know that at some point uh, feedback will be sent through. 
So we did uh, to save bits in space. So it's, this is a very classical uh, region of interest compression with JPEG 2000. Very, very simple. So we focus bits in space where the interest is. Um, and uh, you get some uh, bitrate savings, as you can see here from vanilla, let's say JPEG 2000. So that's going from let's 0.5 bitrate to 1.5 for the same performance. Or we did it also to save bits in color. So traditional view is that if you do, is anybody of you doing image compression or video compression that are related to compression? Or at least they've studied through it a bit. Uh, you do some uh, color decorrelation. You want to create, uh, you're not sending RGB. You're first converting it to another color space. So you remove some of the redundancy. You do energy compaction. And you send this information compressed of each channel. But the optimum energy compaction transform is the PCA, okay? We're also known as the Karhuna level transform, okay? So, but you cannot actually do this thing on a small device because you're not having the energy and the power to actually estimate all these correlation or these covariance matrices. So we did uh, a very fast version uh, of the KLT that you're solving a, a a projection problem uh, subject to some constraints. And Massimo also uh, did the very first supervised version of a color transform. So if I have some training data that tells me this is the, project, the object of interest and this is not the object of interest, find me an optimal color transform that achieves the best way of representing the object in, the, in a new color space plus is good for compression. So it has some properties good for uh, compression. And this is what happens here. Uh, you can see if you're using this color transform, this regular RGB versus our new color transform. And there is also a nice property of our color transform as well, that since you can find where the object is, you can use it as a very simple classifier and combine it with focusing the space in bits. So focus in uh, bits in color and in space at the same time. And the extreme version of that is now if I know that I have a classifier, so I know if I have a hyperplane here, and uh, I know that say that a pixel or an object has some, falls somewhere in the hyperplane in the feature space here, what's the effect of this point in compression? If I compress this point with variable bitrate, how is it moving? So if it's moving towards here, so it's not very bad in terms of classification because it's still with this side of the boundary. But as it's getting closer, it could get worse and worse and worse. And in fact, if it jumps, it's actually making a mistake. Versus if it's moving this direction, it doesn't affect me very much. So we use this property as a way to come up with a new uh, distortion metric that is relates the distortion, which is the difference between a point before compression and after compression with related to the boundary, the classification boundary, and we embed it directly in the rate distortion space, in the rate distortion optimization. So we do rate distortion, so we adapt the rate dynamically for every point, for every element in the compression uh, scheme, and this is for H265 directly. Uh, and, and optimize for good classification performance and good rate, okay, uh, inherently. So this is with respect to the analysis, to the uh, like sensing, but let me tell you a little bit about the computer vision. So we did the phenotyping, we did the sensing, now we're doing the computer vision. So this is some problems that are overall are very interesting from a computer vision perspective, and I'll explain why. So plant segmentation from background, tracking in time, leaf segmentation, leaf tracking, uh, and leaf counting. So sometimes actually getting the phenotype, so doing the analysis of the object, is fairly simple. So here I have images of plants, and the goal is basically I want to get to a binary mask that tells me where is plant and where is not. Sometimes it's very easy, but sometimes you may enter a lab where the biologist is keep watering the plants at the time where the camera is on or where you need the data so you have reflections sometimes the biologist is over watering the plants and is putting a lot of nutrients so you have other plant like matter growing on the soil moss okay or the plant is actually dying because of a stress so it changes color of the leaves so your green is not green anymore 
Um, so even a simple problem can become hard or sometimes the phenotype that you're looking for is very hard. So if you're having 2D images of this plant and your goal is to segment each leaf here, these images are about 400 by 500 pixels, so we're not talking about huge resolutions here. Okay, or if I have give you consecutive video of images and I tell you find me the exact time where you can perceptually see a new flower is coming out. It's a hugely uh, important. Two days of a difference between one plant and the other means that that plant can go to harvest two days earlier and two days earlier in asparagus commands a 45% higher price in the market. So if you're a farmer and your asparagus grows faster you get a 45% more money in your pocket. So what do you try to do? Get asparagus to grow faster, okay? So we uh, published uh, a paper uh, thanks to um, a delightful invitation uh, from a dear friend in the room um, to see what are some of the problems in plant phenotype from a computer vision uh, perspective. Why is it a difficult problem? So if you do 3D, if you work in 3D reconstruction from multi-view uh, imaging and so on, so you have an object here that actually is moving as you're trying to do the imaging. So because there is wind uh, or because as you turn it, you know, if you have a plant that is actually, think of a plant that like a grass, so as you move it with a turntable, you might move, so you have to wait until it sets. Uh, you, it's very hard to have a model, to fit models on the point clouds uh, because we don't have good models for the plants. Uh, we have lots of other issues with hyperspectral because now they're using cameras, they're using helicopters, they're using uh, blimps. They just collect thousands and thousands of data. We don't know how to fuse them, how to integrate them. So there is a lot of, a lot of interesting problems. And before the bottleneck was actually the hardware. So people were trying to build new and new machines, but now that's not the case. Now it's the software and it's actually now the uh, image analysis. So let me give you three examples of what we're trying to do here. So we have um, one of our first ob uh, objectives was to do a rosette segmentation, fast and accurate, uh, that could be robust. So we did the best thing was to say, we're not gonna have any assumptions. The only good assumption we will have is that we're trying to see at a plant and we call the plant appearance model. Not for shape, but texture, intensity, and other some features. So we build this plant, this model, it's a Gaussian mixture model, and we update it at every iteration, and the way we do the segmentation is a probabilistic level set. So the integration of the appearance model with the level set gives you the final segmentation. And at every iteration that gets updated, it accumulates information, at a time point uh, it can also uh, uh, update um, the uh, the final outcome. So you can find out more details uh, in some of the papers if you're interested in level sets and so on. So, and uh, it does uh, uh, fairly well and you can easily obtain some of the phenotyping uh, parameters uh, that, uh, that you need. The problem is that the classical way of using the growth which is measures the segmentation of the plant, like how, where is plant pixels, uh, which is a projected leaf area. This is very, reacts poorly if you have leaves that are growing fast and slow. So within the same scene, you have some leaves that are growing fast and some things that you're growing very slow within the same image, okay? So you have to actually, the gold standard is to do leaf segmentation and tracking, but if you want to do leaf segmentation, you need some of the machine learning algorithms to do that, you need training data. So how do you train data? You need to annotate data, so we created a tool that makes it very easy uh, to annotate data, so you scribble on the images and you do dots or lines, and so on, and you sol we solve it with a graph, uh, alg graph segmentation algorithm, and you obtain a final segmentation uh, very easy. So it's semi, it's interactive, as you can guess, but you go from 30 minutes without using any, any aid to one minute. So that's uh, significantly um, uh, fast. And of course, the tool is uh, open source uh, and is available. Now, leaf counting is a very other important uh, agricultural trait. So how do you solve it until before leaf counting was an aspect of segmentation? So you have to solve the segmentation 
and you obtain by how many disconnected objects you have the count. But we started thinking, can we solve it in a different way? So we said, okay, let's treat it as a classical uh, vision, uh, modern vision with machine learning problem. <coughs> if I'm given image features X, and I'm giving the leaf number, Y, because somebody has annotated the number of leaves in this image, can I solve it as a regression problem? So that's exactly what we did. We do a trick, because we know the plants are growing radially. So we use the log polar representation. Then we take patches, uh, carefully sampled uh, through the images. We learn a dictionary. Then from the dictionary we do uh, encoding on projections of the dictionary. We do some pooling. We get a per plant descriptor. And then we regress this per plant descriptor with support vector regression and we get a leaf count. So you have to th think one thing that this, the size of this dictionary is defining how good you will do the size and the goodness of this representation here. If you do feature representation, it defines how good you do this regression. Bad features your outcome is going to be bad, but if at the same time your regression descriptor is very, very big, we're not having this many plants annotated, so you cannot have, let's say, a descriptor that is 1,000 features long, but you only have 100 plants, 100 annotated observations. So if you think about typical machine learning problems, this is a fat problem, okay, really badly conditioned. So, but uh, thankfully, we are doing things good. So if you think about like training performance and testing performance, if you look at this mean square error between, let's say, ground truth count uh, and predicted count, uh, we are uh, fairly, uh, fairly good uh, in performance. So on average, we make zero errors, uh, more or less, or we are plus or minus one leaf off. And this is just in 2D imaging with very low res uh, images. Okay, because the idea is we use cheap cameras, no zoom, fixed height, fixed uh, focus in order to keep the cost uh, uh, down. So if you think also uh, how manually counting like experts do on the images, this is their performance uh, and uh, we are really, really close actually. We are within human uh, error. So. Let me skip a bit and try to convince you, for those that have some um, interest in that. So, as I said before, there are many interesting computer vision problems. You have a scene that contains many copies of the same object. So in computer vision, this is known as a multi-instance uh, segmentation or multi-instance tracking problem. Uh, and uh, in many cases, things that are happening, they are not entering the scene. So for example, if you do sports analysis, or you're looking you like sports videos, usually you're tracking and you knew the players are entering the camera field of view, right? Here you have new objects growing from the scene. It's not entering, it's easy to deal with things entering if you want to have a new hypothesis, ah, did a new object enter the scene? Here somehow you have something that's below resolution level and suddenly it appears. They grow exponentially. So one day they're there, the other day they're already there. So they come, they come out, so it's very hard to treat with that. Um, and uh, this is something that we find uh, very, very, uh, very interesting. So, and this is not just in plant phenotyping, so if you are doing uh, counting, for example, under different versions of, uh, with clutter, scale, in surveillance, similar problems. You have variability in scale, uh, rotation, or for example, in ornithology. All of these problems come in uh, place. Or if you have in, um, in uh, cell counting uh, and, and so on. So, the problems boil down to good features. So, how can I find good features that are invariant to scale and rotation, that can encode the symmetry of a scene, and at the same time uh, ignore some of the nuisance that you want to actually define? Um, and uh, one of the 
new contributions that we have in the area of representation learning, thankfully to the work of Valerio. So please talk to him after before he can come and visit you whenever you feel like. Uh, and if you want, if you're interested in this, is that how can I learn in an unsupervised fashion uh, ways to create representations that are rotation invariant? So he does this with a probabilistic unsupervised uh, methodology which is called the restricted Boltzmann machine. It's a neural network where you have a visible layer and a hidden layer and they are destinedly connected but not with each other and you're trying to, given data, estimate these hidden latent variables. And he does this with an explicit rotation invariant model. So you are, gi you are assuming a new uh, variable which you are uh, partially observing which is the ob rotation of a particular patch or a particular object, you're feeding it through and you're learning uh, many copies of the same filters but rotated at the same time and they're all contributing to the learning of the other. Uh, and it's a, it leads to very, very compact representations. So if you think about what I said before about the dictionaries of counting, think about it, if you have the same object rotated, if you want to capture this with a way that is not invariant, you basically have to expand the size of the dictionary and somehow use pooling to be able to become invariant to that. Okay? Instead, your actual representation is invariant to this, so your dictionary is very compact. Your representation is very compact and it's cancelling this nuisance and leads to much easier representations. Uh, and uh, he also has a theorem that shows that our representation is actually proven to have rotation invariance using a known invariance metric. In using the MNIST uh, raw data set, uh, which is a benchmark on a similar type of setup, this is kind of like the current state of the art on this problem, we have a 12% uh, difference. Uh, okay, and as you can see here, some of the filters that we learned, the feature representations, and this is the same filter in the different matrices. All these matrices are related with each other by a rotation. So this is actually a rotated version by 40 degrees of that one. Okay, and these are all learned in tandem and inherently. Uh, and it gives you a very nice uh, performance. So these are some of the papers uh, if you want to find some information, but he's also in the audience. So uh, he can give you lots of more details. Now, if we want somehow to make an effect uh, in the future generations and affect the farming practices of the future, of the future with new plants, new varieties, we need to have better analysis algorithms. We said it's the bottleneck. The good thing is that we have good computers now, we have lots of nice experts in computer vision, uh, they uh, do understand the importance, uh, hopefully in me giving lots of talks trying to elevate that. Um, and it's easy to understand the problem, it's not like working in medical imaging where uh, you have to get the pathology a lot to understand it. Now it's a little bit more simple. Ah, it's leaves, I count them, I measure them, I understand it, I get it. Uh, the bad is some of the specific problems. We used to be in specialist journals and there was no data available. Zero, none. When we started, there was no data available to develop algorithms. So we did two things. Uh, one thing is that we start setting up workshops. So we set up the first workshop at ECCV, they call the computer vision problems in fun phenotyping, to actually start you know, disseminating the problems and inviting more and more people. We had, a comp we had a challenge on leaf segmentation, then we had one in BMVC uh, last year. We did one yesterday at BMVA, with one of my colleagues ran it, uh, and then we're trying to do one uh, in Venice uh, in uh, next uh, fall, late fall, uh, hopefully uh, if we have a strong uh, submission. So then we did uh, this, we're trying to publish this uh, kind of like invitation to the community articles so people understand and get more involved and then we also run a couple of special issues. So we also published a year ago a data set complete with annotations uh, on uh, detection, tracking, counting, classification, regression problems uh, and uh, of counting anything you can imagine. It's a very very complete data set. It was the first time it ever happened um, and uh, there is also evaluation routines. We point to metrics, for example, there is a paper by Andrea uh, of 
evaluating tracking performance algorithms and he has a nice set of metrics that could be used so we recommend that for example for tracking because we're trying to say if you want to develop an algorithm that is related please use that data test it and then if you want to evaluate use also this metric so at least we can start comparing with each other so one year after we have about 200 people that have downloaded 23 citations about 90 percent is done by researchers, young researchers and students. Uh, out of those, only 40 of them, 48 of them, are really related to agriculture. The others are essentially machine learning and computer vision. Okay, and now there are three papers in deep learning from top groups uh, that are using uh, the data. So using also the data and a challenge, we organized the collation study, so we all had all these people uh, competing with uh, each other, who's going to have the best performance. And as you know, here is a very big panel of evaluation of different images and how they do. Uh, and as you can guess, when things are nicely separated, there is no clutter, things are good. If there's clutter, if they're overlapping and occlusions, things are not doing uh, well. Uh, but not surprisingly, uh, it was picked up as a very interesting data set from the computer vision community and uh, there was a paper by uh, Philip Tor's group in Oxford using recurrent neural nets, uh, using our data set to solve the multi-instance segmentation problem and then of course it's deep learning so a few months later somebody else came with a better version. Uh, notice here that their segmentation accuracy is 66% with some conditional random field post-processing. So not great on a per-leaf uh, dice. Uh, but then the, from Zemmel's group in uh, Canada, uh, somebody updated the data set and they did a very, very complex deep learning uh, network. Uh, and within a few months, segmentation accuracy went to 85% per leaf, per object, in a very big, low resolution, very low resolution cameras with a huge problems. I mean, that's impressive. Okay, so you can imagine uh, what can happen. So I just hope to have convinced you that um, we can have uh, a match made in heaven by combining all this. So I don't know if I went over the time, but uh, maybe there's somebody else. So I will just try to thank you here and acknowledge uh, most of the people in my lab all of them that work on this, even if they don't, because for the contributions. And thank you for taking your time to come. Thanks. Thank you.